Namaskar to all dignitaries, guests and delegates with great joy and immense adulation. I am Dr. Anupma Dabe Mohanty, Assistant Professor at IP and the co-coordinator of uh, this international webinar. I am the moderator of the session today. We are indeed fortunate to witness today a galaxy of stars in the respective domain and also glad to see the overwhelming participation from India and abroad. Now I take the privilege to invite Professor Nathan Subramanian, Director IP, to welcome the guests and participants. I will take uh, this privilege to give a brief introduction of Professor Nathan. Professor Nathan, a doctorate in management from IIM Ahmedabad, has over 35 years of experience in senior level position both in academics as well as industry. Prior to joining IP Hyderabad as director, Professor Nathan was a program director with Warwick Business School at University of Warwick, UK, which is considered as one of the leading business schools in the world. He also had positions such as area chairperson in IIM Ahmedabad, head of executive programs in Westminster U University, UK, visiting professor in SDA Bocconi, Italy, visiting professor in ES. SEC France and visiting professor in several Australian universities such as University of Western Sydney and Canberra University. Professor Nathan has also worked in the industry for nearly 20 years and held senior level management position at the international level in organization like Coca-Cola, Reader's Digest and DDB Mudra. His role in his organization entailed working at the global level including across Australia, China and U.S. and also India. I request Professor Nathan to please welcome the guest. Over to you, sir. Sir, you are on mute, sir. Sir, please unmute yourself. Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Anupama. Um, a uh, very uh, uh, good day to all of you. Uh, I'm using the word uh, good day, I guess, because uh, I recognize we are all in different parts of the world and I wasn't certain which particular uh, greeting to use. So uh, depending on where you are, good morning, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, a very warm welcome to the, uh, uh, to this, um, um, to the uh, webinar. Uh, I would uh, start by saying on behalf of the organizing committee from the Center for Environment and Economic Development, the CED, uh, the IP, which is Institute of Public Enterprise, uh, National Institute of Disaster Management, which is NIDM, and Odisha State Open University, uh, we warmly welcome the distinguished speakers, panelists, guests, um, and all the participants from India and other countries across the world uh, to this international webinar on disaster reduction, reliance, and uh, sustainability. Uh, now, I am no expert on this topic, I mean, because we are a business school, we cover many different topics, and this is an important uh, part, an important division uh, where we cover. Then I was thinking about it from a layman's perspective. Anupama is the expert, and then we have a few other experts in, in our institute in this area, but then you are all, I mean, I would say, Without question, uh, you know, you have, I, I, I know very little compared to all of you here today on this topic. Uh, so I thought about it from a layman's perspective. Um, and here are some of the things that occurred to me. Uh, this whole topic, I mean, now it's become very contemporary and hot. So this is a layman's perspective. Uh, and, and, and what is interesting, and, I, and, and over time you see a changing scenario. Um, Till not very long ago, a few years ago, it was a topic which mostly experts engaged with, not necessarily a lot of common people. It didn't capture everybody's imagination, okay? And it was often seen as somebody else's problem, particularly if you're in a country, you weren't particularly affected by it, it was seen as somebody else's problem. But the big difference now is you really see it's captured the popular imagination. So it's become a very contemporary, not just contemporary, it's always contemporary, but a hot topic, if you like. 
Okay, um, and I think it's partly for a couple of reasons. I'm sure there are many reasons, but a couple of reasons that came to my mind is if you have a new generation, a new generation of youth who are much, much more engaged with this whole area of sustainability, disaster management, and so on. So, so you know, you have things like Extinction Rebellion going on in the UK, for instance, which is essentially, you know, you have youth driving many of these aspects now, you know, which is, a, and they are common people, common citizens of the world, if you like, you know. Uh, so that's a difference. And, and I think the other thing, obviously, is it's now beginning to affect people across countries. And it's, it, it, people are actually feeling the, starting to feeling the impact of it. You know, previously it was something you read about in the news that occurred in some remote country somewhere, okay, but now everybody's beginning to feel the impact of it, you know, whether it be, you know, flooding in the UK or more recently in, recently in Germany, forest fires in California, drought and fires in, again, in California, if you like, alternating uh, in Australia, you know, drought and fires, those forest fires, you know, huge fires and alternating drought and fire, you know, flooding, they had drought and then they had flooding. Okay, same thing in India, alternating floods, cyclones and droughts in various parts of India. So it's really, it's sort of impacting a lot of people, it's impacting people across the world and, and that's beginning to obviously mean that common people are engaging with, with, the, with the topic and recognizing its criticality for survival and for, for the entire planet's future increasingly. Okay, and obviously water scarcity, we all recognize uh, more and more parts of the world, how it's impacting people. Okay, water rationing has now become very common in many, many countries. Okay, and most futurologists, um, you know, I'm obviously speaking to the to the uh, you know to the converted, so I, I don't need to say this, but but I guess again from a layman's point of view, one recognizes that more you know you have increasing number of articles saying most futurologists now predicting that the next great wars of the world will be fought over water, if you like. Okay, massive migrations taking place, whether we like it or not. Okay, and it's it's and it's going to increase. It's going to increase uh, across countries, across continents, due to disasters and shortages of basic requirements, not just water, but due to drought, due to hunger and that sort of stuff, okay. So, disaster management, therefore, and sustainability has clearly become the topic of the day. Uh, for the first time, it's become a topic of popular engagement, uh, and everybody now recognizes that we ignore these issues at our own peril. Okay? So, in the circumstances, so I think given how contemporary it is, I, I do commend uh, all the concerned parties, uh, CED, IP, NIDM, and Odisha State Open University in organizing this international webinar. Uh, I also, in particular, would like to thank uh, the distinguished speakers uh, who have taken the time to be with us and shared their perspectives, uh, whether it be Dr. Karen uh, Sidmaya Ryu, Dr. Uh, Sanjay Srivasta, Professor Michael the Mayor, Okay, uh, Engdel uh, Loy Rego, Professor Ashitos Mohanty, uh, uh, da, uh, Mr. Gary de la Pomeroy, Professor Arka, uh, Dash Mohapatra, importantly, Major General uh, Manoj Kumar Bindal, with the Chief Patron, Professor uh, Surya Prakash, Dr. Harjit Kaur, okay, Dr. T.S. Rahman, Professor Mohammed uh, Sabir Hussain. Uh, Subhashish Mohanty, Mr. Anil Kumar Sina, IAS, Mr. Akanksha Pandey, Mr. Glenn Banga, Banagos, uh, Mr. Uh, Miki Glantz from the Colorado State University, uh, Mr. Pa Pawan K. Joshi from uh, JNU. Forgive me if I've left out any names, but as you can see, it's a, it's a very distinguished list, and, and we really feel honored that you've taken the time to, to be with us and to share your insights uh, in this, uh, in this uh, webinar. Um, so moving on from a layman's perspective, uh, uh, which I sort of cited more formally, okay, from what now is sort of putting on more the expertise hat, if you like, from your angle, as we know, disaster risk management, re disaster risk reduction is an intrinsic part of uh, social and economic development and is necessary for long-term sustainability. I think the experts already knew that. Uh, this has been acknowledged in a number of worldwide agreements on disaster risk reduction and sustainable development as the first major worldwide framework for disaster risk reduction the yokohama strategy and plan of action for a safer world in 1994 recognized the link between sustainable development and disaster risk reduction and since then this close relationships has been reinforced in key global agreements ranging from the mdg or the millennium development goals to the johannesburg plan 
of implementation, which uh, was in September 2002, uh, the Hyogo Framework for Action, and the, which was in 2005 to 2015, and the Future We Want, uh, which is uh, Rio in June 2012, followed by the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, which is March 2016, and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable development, which is New York, September 2015. Now, again, this is just, I guess, setting the context, but uh, once again, as I just mentioned before, uh, I guess I, I am probably the least educated on this as compared to all the distinguished speakers here. So I'm sure you would take this forward and you would have a lot more to say on this. So once again, um, I, I am, I'm very sure that uh, given the the really distinguished uh, panelists and speakers we have, I'm sure uh, many different facets and perspectives will get discussed. Uh, by our speakers and panelists, and we'll have a few more insights, or many insights, on this very contemporary topic at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much for being here, and once again, a very warm welcome to this webinar, and I hope you all enjoy the webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, you so much. Nathan. Uh, you have not only given a layman perspective, I can say, but also given us a chronological uh, development of disaster risk reduction very briefly. So it was really nice to hear both the perspective at a time. Thank you so much, sir. Now I take the privilege to invite the program coordinator, Professor Ashutosh Mohanty, to give a brief introduction of today's program. Professor Ashutosh Mohanty is an international researcher, professor, mentor, and practitioner, and having 19 years of academic and professional experience in more than 50 countries with different capacities. He is serving as professor of Madhyanchal Professional University, Faculty of Science and Technolo Technology at Center of Excellence in Disaster Management and Environment. He also presently serves as adjunct professor in Disaster Management Department uh, at Odisha State Open University, Government of Odisha, at Sambalpur. He is also a resource person and member of the Consortium for Capacity Building, CCB, INSTAR, University of Colorado, USA, and co-principal investigator in National Geographic Explore Grant in USA in 2020-21. Besides that, Professor Mohanty had also a good experience working as a director of disaster management and climate change at Shuluni University. And prior to this, he was with Truman Graduate School Public Affairs at Mongolia International University, joint graduate school program with University of Missouri, USA. He did his PhD in urban environment risk governance under mentorship and research support from Dr. Michael Glantz, director at Consortium for Capacity Building at INSTAR, University of Colorado, USA, and also completed his MSc in Urban Environment Risk Management at Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand. Uh, sir, I request you to please give a description of today's webinar. Over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, it's my privilege and my honor to be here and welcome all of the delegates of this uh, conference. First of all, I, I would like to thank uh, Professor Nathan giving a very elaborate, uh, that, that doesn't mean like he's telling all the layman perspective, but a uh, expert perspective on this over there. So I would like to give um, much thanks because he is uh, giving the, uh, you know, like a keynotes as well as some kind of thoughts to which could be, a, uh, we'll look forward to take it further. Another way, I can give thanks to our, uh, you know, uh, Vice Chancellor Arko Kumar Das Mahapatra, so because because of his uh, thought and his, uh, you know, like uh, inspiration, we bring this uh, program to this, uh, uh, you know, uh, reality because he has given the idea, thoughts, and some kind of, uh, you know, virtual inputs that uh, the program could be uh, realized. In that way, I would also uh, thanks to other, uh, you know, the panelists also. Uh, uh, Anupama Dubeji and also Manas Kumar Binder, the executive director of NIDM. Also, I have to give thanks uh, Matt uh, from the um, New Mexico University US, Mr. Uh, uh, Karen from uh, uh, the senior advisor from UNEP, uh, Geneva office. Then we'll have to give Gary, he's uh, very, uh, you know, he's giving um, most input in for our program. 
Uh, also, we have to give uh, thanks to other, uh, you know, relevant persons like uh, Royal Ego because she is uh, one of the pioneer who was giving inputs to several DRR program in South Asia. So this is all about the uh, our, uh, you know, all delegates to welcome. And now I will give you some briefing how this, uh, you know, uh, webinar materialized. Uh, once last week we have uh, uh, some time back uh, we have a uh, international uh, workshop where uh, we got some kind of input from our uh, from our students and research scholar they told us like please uh, we could organize a, some international event because there are a number of national events already uh, take place in india and we want some international inputs and also some kind of insight from uh, you know un peoples that's why i talk with uh, you know arka kumar sir and other uh, delegates then why then we select some of the best uh, resource person from the globally and uh, many thanks to all the resource person that they have accepted our uh, invitation and uh, give us very precious time that this uh, uh, works that webinar take place so we uh, finally have uh, giving some kind of uh, good inputs and good thoughts because so many uh, students and researchers are very much excited to learn about disaster risk reduction about the resilience and sustainability because it is very interlinked if you see there is a disaster and the post disaster there is a development so we have to cannot compartmental with the disaster and the development when you talk about the managerial things because it is a very uh, very much, uh, you know side by side with management how you manage the disaster from the starting from the all disaster cycle from uh, disaster happening uh, then we have to have a, this cycle comes with the response rescue rehabilitation and some kind of uh, you know uh, future risk management so this whole cycle is a very uh, very compatible very require as for the research but i cannot take long time because the resource person are very much uh, you know very very expert and they have, they have published several uh, public uh, good papers as well as they lead many international disaster programs so let's learn from these people and lot from the experts from our panel i must very much i heartily congratulate all the delegates from globally particularly the karen the you know like gary and other uh, professors uh, professor match uh, so we we can learn from their uh, you know their presentation then we can discuss how it could be take it further so thanks a lot again i i i i if there is any uh, you know issues and i uh, miss some of the uh, points so sorry for that because in this uh, this way i i uh, take over to the anupama to take it further thank you very much thank you professor mohanty for elaborating uh, the effort which we really did and the initial uh, thought that came in mind of professor mohanty is the person who actually initiated this it is great honor uh, for us that today we have dr sanjay kumar shrivastava chief disaster risk reduction economic and social commission for asia and the pacific i take the privilege to introduce dr shrivastava dr sanjay kumar shrivastava chief of disaster risk reduction economic and social commission for asia and the pacific he is the chief advisor of unescap unesc asia pacific sanjay kumar shrivastava is presently uh, as i said that he is the chief of disaster risk reduction at un economic and social for asia pacific he was uh, also uh, associated with escape escap regional advisor on disaster risk reduction from october 2009 to june 2014 head of sark disaster management center new delhi from 2007 to 8 deputy project disaster director of disaster management support program at india space research organization isro scientist an engineer at isro headquarter bangalore since 1991 he is the recipient of isro's team excellence award in 2008-9 for his contribution towards harnessing space technology applications for the benefit of rural people he has more than 100 publications on disaster risk reduction including research papers in peer reviewed international journals intergovernmental reports and book His area of expertise includes early warning system for hydrometeorological disaster ICT and space applications for disaster response and risk reduction risk assessment post disaster need and damage assessment and recovery planning integration of disaster risk reduction in climate change adoption so i uh, request dr shrivastava 
to please deliver his address. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Anupama, and uh, my heartfelt. I hope I'm audible. Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, much audible. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Anupapa, and uh, my sincere thanks to my dear friend, Professor Asutosh Mohanty, for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. So, thank you again. It's a it's a real privilege to be here among the, in the midst of the, the some of the finest mind in this subject. Uh, let me share some thoughts uh, because uh, in my present capacity as a uh, with the UN uh, Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific. I thought I will share some thoughts from my organization and uh, especially this is the uh, audience of academics people. So some food for thought, some key takeaway messages. So my uh, the, the talk is motivated by the titles of this webinar, uh, the connecting the dots, the dot between resilience and sustainability. I thought let me uh, bring uh, uh, a spotlight uh, what is this dot and how this dot can be uh, connected. So my uh, second slide is to show to you uh, the sustainability. Uh, if you look at sustainability from the most recent sustainable development goals uh, reported by all countries, particularly in Asia and Pacific, where do they stand? So if SDGs are the measures of sustainability, from that perspective, you see this is like a scorecard for different countries of the regions. Of course, uh, we have put all countries together, so it gives you the sustainability scorecard of Asia and Pacific. Uh, what I would like to invite, especially your attention is, the region is fell sort of 2020 milestone for sustainable development goal, even before entering into the global, global pandemic, that is the COVID. Uh, on current tra trajectory, when you see, less than 10% of SDG targets are on track to be achieved by 2030, and those are only few countries. But what is most alarming, which I especially would like to spotlight, is the climate action goal 13 and life below water. So these are the two goals where region is moving into a negative direction, opposite, regression. And these, both these goals are related to disaster resilience. So when you talk about the connection between sustainability and resilience, the situation today is a disconnect. We are not growing, means what I would like to say, the uh, resilience, uh, the risk is outspacing resilience in Asia Pacific and which is uh, something quite serious. Now, uh, let me come to you on the story of the resilience in present context. Resilience is uh, becoming very complex in today's context, particularly in the midst of the global pandemic. You see the reality uh, what as it exists, there is a uh, scenario one, which all of us are aware of, uh, risk drivers, which is poverty, uh, the, the vulnerability, the uh, all kinds, what you see is a part of the scenario environmental degradation. So you see many of the sustainability goals as a part of the scenario which exists. Now comes to scenario two, which is climate change. Climate change, which of course it uh, it, uh, the, the, all the hazards, the risk, it uh, escalates. Then you come to scenario three, scenario C, which is the pandemic. And then uh, the, the, the D, which is a pandemic and plus water and vector and bond diseases associated with the climate extremes. So you put all scenarios together, it becomes our knowledge, capacity to manage disaster risk 
but when the risk is in form of such kind of cascade quite complex systemic managing such scenario is truly challenging uh, i would like to tell you because uh, it it cannot be by one agency approach it has to be whole of the government approach and especially the highest level of the government the planning and finance ministry so what we did in unescap was we tried to see what is the economic cause of the cascade of the risk and in the process we brought out this analytics it's published in asia pacific disaster report when you take because this is required for 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 the finance minister to put some of the numbers from the budget especially to address disaster risk resilience situation when you only take the intensive risk the average annualized average cost in asia pacific is around 140 million dollar which is 0.5% of region's gdp but when you use intensive extensive together you see the number goes up when you use slow onset disaster this number changes substantially but when you use biological hazards which i was talking to you a short while ago this number goes up further but when you take everything together your natural hazards biological hazards together the number becomes 780 billion dollar annualized average loss in asia pacific which is 2.5% per, of the region's gdp this region is the growth engine of the world losing 2.5% every year is something not sustainable and when you take the climate change like rcp 4.5 scenario these numbers becomes 2.5 to 3.7 when you take the worst case scenario it becomes 4.2% so this kind of economic implications of climate change or in cascade of the disasters will have a very serious impact on the sustainability of the region in days to come uh, my next slide shows on the solution part what to do and i am happy that i am talking in front of all researchers and and the top well, the the think tanks of many parts of the world including india uh, we have done what to do how much money you need to spend as a part of the adaptation and resilience you have seen many report in the past and the most recent one adaptation gap report by un environment my colleague uh, karen is here uh, uh, what we would like to emphasize particularly this adaptation gap is we used health adaptation also from annualized average loss that includes hazards the natural and biological hazards together and then you look at what is regions overall asset economic asset 331.7 trillion is overall economy of asia pacific out of which 780 billion dollar is annualized average loss but then how much you need to adapt to this cascade of disaster is 269 billion the benefit cost ratio is 5 to 1 this is from the cascading cascades of the disaster but where this money is to be spent that's the most important question all the investment must be risk informed but then what those investments are these are the investments of investing in multi hazard integrated early warning system making infrastructure resilient strengthening uh, especially water resilient infrastructure mine grew and so on all put together contributes to your adaptation and resilience pathways in a country and those are what is more important is these investment must be risk informed uh, my next slide shows that in unescap i am very happy many of the students and researchers are here in unescap we have brought a tool we have developed a tool how will you quantify the resilience and adaptation cost at a country level depending on what we call risk escape the risk escape of biological and natural hazards at a country level and in your country which interventions will have the maximum benefit and cost ratio this is based on the some of the research which came from the global adaptation commission the 
uh, and uh, we contextualized in Asia Pacific. So uh, next to that is this is one you have to invest in resilience and investing in resilience must be risk informed. The second point which I would like to highlight at the end of my presentation is which are going to be the game changer. Game changer is one investing in resilience must be risk informed. Second is the technology, especially in the COVID time, I would uh, I would conclude by this numbers is uh, just before COVID in 2018, we there was a UN report of the frontier technology brought by Onta Geneva office. Uh, the global business of frontier technology was uh, uh, was something 328 billion. By 2025, this number is going to be close to four trillion dollars. Means the world is moving towards all kind of innovations and technologies, whether it is a uh, IoT, Internet of Things, the commercial device, data, connected device, data, drones, social media, earth observation, geospatial. So all technologies put together with cloud computing, uh, cloud computing, digitalizations, big data analytics, and all risk analytics to, together, the understanding of disasters is going to be multiplied many times. So what we were talking about, risk-informed investment will become much simpler than what it is today. Same is post-disaster and damage and loss assessment. So these are the hopes for the future in the riskier world when resilience becomes a very big challenge. There are possibilities that technology, particularly the frontier technology, risk-informed investment will close the gap between sustainability and disaster resilience. So thank you, uh, Professor Asitosh and colleagues. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. This is what I would like to conclude my discussion. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you, Dr. Srivastava. It was indeed uh, a very informative uh, lecture uh, where you started from the problem and also uh, explained the solution of that. We are really blessed today that uh, you accepted our invitation. Sir, may I quickly take a question? Only one question? Uh, sure, sure. Okay. Uh, okay. A participant had asked that, sir, can you please share the difference between scenario C and scenario D? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, my dear. Uh, scenario D was when you have a pandemic in midst of water and vector bound diseases. Uh, see, for example, if I quote you the example of uh, uh, Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, uh, where there are floods at present at this point of time, also there are pandemic uh, widespread, and also there are water and vector bound diseases or cholera, dengue, all kinds of things. So you have poverty, vulnerability, disaster risk. You have water and vector bound diseases. We, you have a pandemic. Many of floods were contributed by this climate change. So all put together. This is what is the scenario B. And scenario C was when COVID was not there. So you have a usual case of water, vector bound diseases, flood, and risk drive. I hope I have uh, to answer the questions. Right. Thank you so much, sir, for your words of wisdom. It will be great pleasure for us to listen to you again in our future events. Thank you once again. Uh, now I'm moving to another speaker. Uh, we are indeed fortunate to have with us Professor Michael and Dean Moss. Professor Dean Moss is a professor emeritus of geography, specialization in GIS science, geographic education, and landscape ecology. Professor Emeritus of Geography applied geography New Mexico State University, USA. Professor Mikey is the 2018 winner of the Wheeler Speak Lifetime Achievement Award given by the New Mexico Geographic Information Council and a 2010 winner of Anderson Medal for, of Honor in Applied Geography. This is considered as the highest award given by the Applied Geography speci Speciality Group of the American Association of Geographers, as we all geographers know it as ARG. He has over 80 research articles and six geographic information system texts. Uh, 
uh, I think what could be easier is if because he's emailed it. I think did you, uh, professor, did you email it to Anupama or to Srinivas? Uh, I have the entire full screen. Here we go. Because he's not really all. Okay, well, how about I give it without, without the, uh, the slides? Slides are almost built. Irrelevant anyway. I don't want to waste any, any more time uh, on the slides. So I'll just go ahead and talk to you what I'm talking So the title of my talk is Realizing Integrated Disaster Management Potential and Promise in the River Valley. Uh, and I'm going to mention briefly some of the challenges, which you already know. Uh, and they include water depletion, water pollution, flooding, earthquakes, landslides, irrigation shortages, and of course many, many others. Some of these are related to climate change. Some of them are not. And the, the idea of using GIS is not strange to this type of environment. Uh, something I actually worked on uh, during the 9-11 uh, attack in our city. So what disaster management is something that's pretty well understood. There are basically six major tasks that GIS can be used uh, for this particular purpose. The first one is preparedness. And preparedness includes things like resource inventory, logistics planning, evacuation planning, communication planning, and needs assessment. There's also recovery and rehabilitation which includes spatial planning, infrastructure, housing, and livelihood. The third major task that GIS is useful for is prevention and mitigation. This includes scientific hazards analysis, simulation and modeling, vulnerability analysis, risk assessment and mapping, stock assessment, that includes livestock, of course. Another category of analysis is the relief. So we can do search and rescue, rubble and debris removal, logistics, delivery of relief supplies, prioritizing actions. Then we have response, which includes situation analysis, crisis maps, information communication, evacuation and shelters, dispatching resources, and early damage assessment. And last is prediction and warning, which includes monitoring, forecasting, early warning, and scenario identification. These are some of the things that GIS can bring to the fore. Now, uh, if there are people there who don't know what GIS is, I'm just going to give a brief analysis here. Geographic Information Systems is a set of computerized tools that allow for the input, storage, management, analysis, and output of spatial data and information. And these tools have been around since the 1960s, and they've become quite sophisticated. And all of the scenarios that I've given you here before all six of these things are tools that are readily useful or readily used within GIS. So that's more or less my expertise. Uh, you've already gotten this wonderful introduction of, of me, but the thing is that using GIS is a set of tools is nice, but it doesn't you know, actually solve the problem. Because ultimately, Without policy, we have nothing to work with. So under policy, we have policy review, 
policy development and policy implementation. And fortunately, I am recruiting in my team on this end of the, the aisle here, a professor by the name of Bill King, who's a retired professor of civil engineering in New Mexico State University. And he specializes in water resources engineering. He served in the Peace Corps and as a science and technology policy fellow with the AAAS at the uh, National Science Foundation and as a Bill Daniels Fellow for Ethics. One of the reasons I've recruited him, I've known him for about 25 years now, and he's not only an engineer, but he's also a policy analyst. So he matches the, the engineering that allows us to solve some of these problems with the policies and procedures at various uh, national and, and regional levels that allow us to solve some of these problems. However, there's one other item that I think is really important in the use of these tools, and that is cooperation. And in that regard, I have also recruited a gentleman by the name of Jeffrey Goble. Jeffrey Goble belongs or has a, his own consulting firm called Community Consensus Institute. I've worked with him for the past seven or eight years at least, uh, possibly more. His specialty is consensus building. And one of the things that he has done, he's worked around the world, and one of the things that he has been able to do is to bring disparate individuals and organizations together and identify the common problem and arrive at common solutions. Uh, his techniques are rather interesting. I have gone through his, his process before and, in fact, have signed up for further training so that I understand more about what he is doing. Uh, but one of the things that he does is he focuses on the idea of listening to each other. Uh, one of the problems we frequently have when we try to do management of any kind of large-scale project is that we hear many voices, but none of them are speaking to the same problem. And so he really drills down into what the problems are, and more importantly, what the proposed solutions are. Uh, he was working in Africa some years ago, and he asked the, the uh, people of a particular village what their problem was, and they said, well, we, we don't have enough water to irrigate our fields. And he said, well, how much water do you need to irrigate your fields? And they, they gave him a number, and he said, how much is that compared to what you have now? And they said, it's three or four times what we have now. And he said, so what would a good goal be for you to uh, increase your water? And he said, their response was, if we could get three times more water, we would be very happy. By the time he got done with his process of community and, and consensus building, and it took over a year, but by the time he was finished, when they implemented his plan, they actually had 10 times the water that they had anticipated. This is the kind of results I'm hoping we can get from a project that we're working on, trying to put together, uh, and I, uh, at the risk of being a cultural outsider, I'm going to uh, recite a, uh, a quote by uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And he said that I do not believe in the doctrine of the greatest good for the greatest number. It means in its nakedness that in order to achieve the supposed good of 51%, the interest of 49% may be, or rather should be, sacrificed. It is a heartless doctrine and has done harm to humanity. And his last line is the most important. The only real dignified human doctrine is the greatest good of all. And this is one of the reasons why I have invited uh, Jeff Goble to join my team, is because this is what he focuses on. He tries to achieve the greatest good of all. And so what I would like to do then in this project that we're working on, and we're working on trying to find funding for it, uh, is to do three things, is to bring in the technology of GIS and other 
uh, techniques, of course, and then the policy analysis part, and finally using Jeff Goebel to bring all of these disparate parts together, hopefully to provide a solution for the uh, overall good of the valley. And that's my talk. Are there any questions? Thank you so much, Professor Michael, for sharing with us your life experience and also uh, a very good uh, uh, the thought which uh, Professor had shared that the greatest good for greater number, that is not uh, the solution for. And the way uh, Sir had explained the role of GIS in resolving the uh, in combating the problems is very significant and very crucial because uh, Thank you once again, sir. As I mentioned earlier also, that in spite of uh, uh, being an odd time for you, you joined us and you have shared not only the ideas, but uh, these are the, uh, the experience of your own life. So thank you once again, sir. I also request the participants to drop uh, your questions because we are running short of time. So we may uh, drop the mail to a specific person. Uh, or at the end, if we get time, we will definitely raise your questions. Thank you, sir. May I now take the privilege to invite Dr. Kareem, Senior Advisor, Disaster and Conflict Program, United Nations Environment Program, Geneva. We are indeed fortunate uh, to have you with us, ma'am. Dr. Kareem, Senior Advisor, Disaster and Conflict Program, UNEP Geneva, is a Senior Advisor uh, in the Disaster Risk Reduction with UNEP, Disaster and Conflict Program, Karin ha has over a decade of experience researching, teaching, and publishing on the topic, the ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction. She is currently coordinating a global project on ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction, which includes the development of a postgraduate course and two massive open online courses on ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction. She is also a scholar of ecosystem-based landslide management with expertise from Nepal. She holds a PhD in environmental science from University of Lausanne, UNIL, Switzerland, and master's degree in international development and forest ecology from Switzerland and US. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Anupama. Thank you, Dr. Ashutosh and other colleagues for the kind words and the introduction and the invitation. I'm very uh, pleased to be here today and uh, privileged to be among such a distinguished uh, colleagues um, in the meeting today. I would kindly request if the IT person can share my slides, which were sent previously. Yes, ma'am. Definitely. To avoid any technical issues. Yes, ma'am. I'll be sharing the PPT. Thank you, and I'll just ask you to go from one slide to the next. Yes, ma'am. So I, thank you very much. I come to the connecting the dots approach from the environment side of disaster risk reduction, which is something that I have been together with uh, my team and others at UNEP and working on for over a decade. And I'd like to give you a bit of an update on where things stand uh, in this field. And uh, also, I can speak just really briefly about uh, some of the work uh, we're doing uh, in India as well. I realize I should have included one more slide, but we'll see, we'll get to that. Next slide, please. So the overview is very simple. Uh, why are ecosystem approaches important for resilience and sustainability? Um, they have been severely overlooked as part of a DOR portfolio of possible approaches, which is something that we're trying to correct. So I want to also just go through really quickly um, what are some of the global opportunities and how you can get more involved. Next slide. Please next. So this is a photo, oh, oh, too quick, go back please. This is a photo, a very unfortunate photo of the border between two countries. Two countries but one island, Haiti and Dominican Republic. 
This shows the importance really of why ecosystems need to be part of a comprehensive and systems thinking approach to reducing disaster risk. Because what happens when a hazard event such as a cyclone hits the island in exactly the same way, actually it hit Dominican Republic first. Next slide. Well, this is what happened when Stop Tropical Storm Jean hit the island in 2004, hitting Dominican Republic first with 6,000 casualties in Haiti and very few casualties in Dominican Republic. And most of those casualties were from the same town on the border with Haiti due to a mud flow that started in a watershed that had no more trees. Next slide, please. Keep clicking through the photos there. I think one little more click will show a, a red dot, a red circle. One more click forward. There. So, no. <laughs> please go back. Yeah, so this is another example from Sri Lanka. You'll see on the uh, top uh, above pictures a um, safari resort called Yala Safari Resort, which was completely obliterated uh, by the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, which hit uh, the southern part of Sri Lanka. There was a ranger station that was completely obliterated as well. Uh, with many casualties, very tragically. The bottom photo, however, you see a ranger station that is nestled behind sand dunes that was kept completely intact uh, by the same tsunami. Now, uh, the sand dunes on the top part of the photo had been removed for better ocean views. So let's find a way of working with nature instead of working against nature for reducing disaster risk. Next slide, please. This gives a conceptual framework of and something you can find on the website there, PEDRR.org, which is the Partnership for Environment and Disaster Risk Reduction, which I will get back to in, in a moment. I'm sure you're hearing some terms like nature-based solutions, uh, ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction, ecosystem-based adaptation, and you might feel a little bit confused. But rest assured, uh, they are all working towards sustainable development. Uh, they're different, slightly different ways of um, approaching the topic. But really, uh, nature-based solutions can be considered an umbrella term uh, that encompasses both ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction, which is what our team works on, and ecosystem-based adaptation, which is, I'm sure, something you've heard of as well. These approaches are various ways of reducing disaster risk and achieving <coughs> sustainable development on a spectrum from uh, disaster risk, um, ecosystem-based uh, disaster risk reduction or ECODR being fit focused a bit more on uh, including early warning systems together with watershed management, for example, whereas EBA or ecosystem-based adaptation might focus a bit more on climate smart agriculture or drought resistant seeds, uh, which is something that we focus a bit less on. But the overall goals are the three key icons there, meeting the needs of people, uh, taking care of the planet uh, for the long term, and dealing with climate change. Okay, So that you can come back to this infographic on our website and take a closer look at it. Um, so some of the ways that we are, how are we actually doing this work? Um, comes through working with uh, in cities uh, by ensuring that there are more um, places for water to infiltrate um, and not cause problems with stormwater runoff. So green infrastructure, blue infrastructure, landscape restoration, uh, but also wetlands restoration, urban greening, sustainable land and integrated fire management integrated water resource management, integrated coastal zone management, and protected areas. Now, some of these approaches, such as integrated water resource management, is not new. It's been around for decades and decades. But it has not always included actors that deal with disaster risk. Land use management is extremely important, but has not always included risk. So what we need is risk-sensitive land use management, for example. Just to give you a few ideas. Next slide, please. So here what we have is we can speak of both natural infrastructure, uh, which can include uh, mangrove belts, 
You know, of course, on the fur farthest on the right, build infrastructure. You're, you're familiar with the seawalls, uh, the river dikes, um, all of the kind of gray infrastructure with which disaster risk reduction has traditionally been reliant upon. This is where our civil engineers come into play. Uh, this is where governments procure uh, huge contracts uh, for uh, protecting coastlines. But in many countries, we found that these are now limited. Um, and countries such as the Netherlands are actually taking down, uh, not necessarily their seawalls, but they're taking down their river dikes and making more space for water. We're finding now that working in a hybrid system is one of the most effective, where we work with ecological engineers, ecologists working with civil engineers to find those approaches where we can work with nature rather than working against nature. Because we're finding that the built uh, defenses are no longer adequate in the climate change scenarios that we have ahead of us. Next step, or next uh, slide, please. So what we have been doing over the past decade is that we have been building the scientific evidence for EcoDR. We've received a lot of questions about, well, okay, a mangrove is nice, uh, it provides livelihoods, benefits, but how strong will a mangrove be in protecting a population from a major tsunami? Well, uh, so what we have done in this paper, which was recently published uh, in Nature Sustainability, is that we have gathered the scientific evidence for EcoDRR. You can download the paper from uh, this link here. Perhaps the I can put the, this link um, in the chat uh, once I'm done speaking. But some of our main findings really, um, and interesting enough is that most of the papers that we reviewed, so this is a review uh, paper of the literature since the last 20 years where we analyzed 529 papers using a process very similar to the IPCC review process where we found uh, actually a lot of the literature was on, related to urban, uh, urban stormwater runoff. Coastal um, was another a big group, mountains and forests. Some of the strongest, I would say, evidence we found was actually from mountain areas um, showing that um, um, ecosystems on uh, steep slopes are one of the strongest uh, correlations. There was a bit less evidence from coastal systems and uh, a lot of the papers came from the global north. Uh, so there's definitely a research gap in the global south. Uh, for demonstrating also how ecosystems could be more effective along coastal areas. I'll stop there. Next uh, slide. But more evidence is needed. Challenges. You're going to have to keep clicking whoever's clicking. There. I'll tell you when to stop. There. Stop, please. That's fine. So challenges now with ecosystem-based disaster reduction is we need performance standards. If we're going to convince policymakers that they need to invest in a mangrove belt to protect the coastline, well, it should hold up to the sim similar standards as for that sea wall that I showed you. The sea wall has performance standards and engineers can calculate how, what, uh, what types of pressures the gray wall can withstand. It's a bit less, uh, it's a bit more tricky for mangrove belt. Uh, so we are, uh, trying to really promote, um, and there's way a lot more research now to develop performance standards also for engineering, for ecological engineering uh, solutions. Um, guidelines for hybrid gray green DR designs can sometimes be very localized. What will work uh, for a mangrove belt in India may not be exactly the same as in Jamaica. Digital technology can be a, a challenge in terms of how can we find uh, the best way to really assess a mangrove belt, for example, versus a seawall? Integrated risk management uh, is something that really needs to be uh, more widely mainstreamed as well as risk sensitive land use planning, and it has not yet. But all these challenges can equally be opportunities. Please uh, keep clicking. I think there are four more points there. We have a green wave, really, that uh, is coming through not only uh, in the global, wars, uh, global north, but we're also seeing uh, sponge cities uh, appearing in, uh, in China. We've seen also some move towards this in India as well. There is growing amount of evidence and experience and more uh, engineer, ecological engineering uh, programs are out there. And global, um, there's a global urgency um, on climate change which really is pushing innovation. 
And so I really encourage uh, any students on this call to think more about how they can be working with nature rather than against nature as part of a DR portfolio um, of options. Next slide, please. So just very briefly, there are also global opportunities. Next. So here are some of the global framework agreements that are all related to ecosystem-based disasters reduction. The main and obvious one is the Sendai framework, uh, which, um, as you may know, included quite a lot of language on ecosystem-based approaches, uh, for which our group, uh, PEDER, was very proud. But then when we got to the Sendai Monitor, we all uh, found that somehow something slipped through the cracks. Uh, the only place where we find any mention to ecosystems are two footnotes two footnotes only in the Sendai Monitor. One is in target C and in target D, where uh, green infrastructure is mentioned as a type of critical infrastructure. But there um, has, to our knowledge, not yet been a member state that has yet reported on green infrastructure as part of the Sendai Monitor. I'll come back to what we're trying to do about that. UNFCCC, uh, this year, COP26, one of the five main themes is on nature-based solutions. Um, and so we're gearing up towards supporting uh, member states in um, developing more guidance and, and also uh, seeing how this will, this will pan out. Uh, but it is a now major global theme. Convention of Biogeological Diversity, as you may know, uh, this is one of the key binding agreements that is now being negotiated um, and has been um, um, now prolonged um, due to COVID, but we're also following that and seeing how disaster risk reduction can be part of CBD. Ramsar, uh, UNF, UNCCD, and UNESCO are all also very important uh, international framework agreements for which there are decisions or parts of their decisions that talk about disaster risk reduction or about ECODR. So to keep those in mind. Next slide. So what are we doing about it? We have recently launched one of uh, a flagship uh, document called Nature-Based Solutions for Disasters Reduction, Words into Action. This is part of the UN uh, Office of Disaster Risk Reduction's uh, uh, series of technical guidelines. And this year, uh, the theme is on uh, nature-based solutions. Uh, it was launched um, in June, and we, were, we will be having webinars and reaching out to member states and, uh, to show them how they can incorporate uh, ECODR or nature-based solutions into their national DR strategies. Next slide. How can you get involved? All right, so next slide. So here's the Partnership for Environment and Disaster Risk Reduction. Uh, we have been working for over a decade with some of the main leading global partners, uh, UN agencies, um, international NGOs, and we're working now more and more with the humanitarian community. You'll see their IFRC, the International Federation of Red Cross Red Crescent, is one of our uh, partners. Mercy Corps is another humanitarian organization and others. So we're branching out also to incorporate and discuss with the humanitarian community how to prevent uh, future um, humanitarian crises um, with, uh, through nature-based solutions, uh, ecosystem-based disaster reduction. Next slide. This is, uh, uh, I want to have two messages with this slide. One is just uh, really briefly our priority areas of work, our advancing science knowledge, strengthening capacities for implementation upscaling, and policy advocacy and mainstreaming. So I've talked about most of these. Now this is a photo of a, uh, a, um, some women uh, working in Kerala. Uh, I wanted to just mention briefly some of the work we're doing at the community uh, level uh, through the Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guaranteed Scheme, which all of you in India know is one of your largest development programs. And for all foreigners on the call, it's maybe one of the largest development programs in the world. Now, without knowing it, uh, this program actually does some DRR, eco-DRR work. Um, they, uh, in many cases, actually do uh, riverbed restoration. Sometimes they do plantations on steep slopes, but not always in a very, I would say, systematic way or a very um, um, scientific way. So we have been developing modules uh, with working with uh, these community projects and trying to now upscale them. So we will be working with Dr. Anil Gupta at NIDM. Uh, National Institute for Disaster Management, so how we can upscale this work to other states in India. 
Next slide, please. So I don't know if there's time, uh, but if um, for this one minute uh, promo video, it's okay if we skip it if there's not time. But I would like to let you know that we have a current ma uh, massive open online course on this topic. It's free, it's open for everyone. We have 50,000 current uh, participants registered. And um, this is open until the end of next year. It's, uh, would probably take you six hours total to go through the end of the course. You will receive a UNEP certificate. So I encourage you, your friends, your family, we even have uh, had any uh, anyone from nine years old to 90 years old take our course. So uh, we encourage you to take it. Um, if there's time to show the video, that's fine. Otherwise, we'll go to the last slide uh, and how you can reach us. You can go ahead, ma'am. Okay, then I kindly ask IT to click on the arrow in the middle. Uh, can you go back? The video... Mr. Srinivas, please click, click on... Click in the middle. There should be the video starting. Okay. Let's see if it works. No. There should be an arrow in the middle of the slide. No. Okay. That's all right. It looks like uh, we didn't have time to test it, so it's not working. That's fine. If you go to the last slide, please. Not to worry. Don't worry. Last slide shows our social media in very small text. So hopefully these PowerPoints will be shared with you. Um, and you can find us on all the different social media there as well. Um, so we have, we're on Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok. Uh, you mentioned it. We're there. And uh, please find our website, petter.org. And um, you can also find our promo video for those who are interested on our website. So with that, I thank you. And I, if there's time for a couple of questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Karim, for a very insightful and uh, 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 lecture in which you have connected the dots as very well you said that a policy is required when we should take risk factor also into consideration. It is a high time when we should change our approach from exploiting our natural resources to actually use it in a sustainable way. So as uh, Dr. Green said, I will take a couple of questions very quickly. Uh, Ma'am, first question is that what are the basic disasters that can be avoided by ecosystem-based system and how it will be effective for earthquake and tsunami type of disaster? Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I wish I had had more time to get into detail. So some examples are when we have wetlands that can absorb flood water. So flooding is one, uh, definitely. Uh, when we have trees on steep slopes, uh, in this case, we can both reduce uh, flooding by allowing the trees to allow the water to infiltrate into the ground. Uh, we can also reduce landslides by having uh, vegetation on steep slopes. In our climates also, uh, we can reduce some, uh, at least stop avalanches uh, from occurring as well as uh, mud flows. Um, on coastal areas, it really depends on, I cannot just say that a, a mangrove will stop any tsunami. That's not correct. Uh, some types of, uh, I would say, uh, waves can be reduced by having strong coastal defenses. You saw the sand dunes, right, in my presentation. There is a good example. So we have to be very scientific about that. So in some cases, cyclones uh, could be reduced, uh, especially by sand dunes and in combination with other vegetation. Uh, tsunamis and earthquakes, there was in the question I see as well. I personally studied, um, have personally studied landslides, um, earthquake-induced land, landslides and rainfall-induced landslides, and vegetation can be very effective for both. Now, of course, it depends on the magnitude, it depends on where, so I cannot say that as a blanket statement, and for tsunamis, it really depends on the magnitude of the event and the type of coastal system, um, natural coastal system that we're talking about. I hope that helps answer. Thank you so much, ma'am. Another question, although you have already answered it, but uh, the question is that could you please discuss the disaster recovery strategies that could be taken at global level to minimize the impact of disaster, both natural and man-made, except ecosystem-based disaster management? I'm not quite sure that I understand the question because you're asking about disaster recovery strategies. Yes. 
at the global level? Well, first of all, I think it's difficult to have a global level disaster recovery strategy, and perhaps uh, uh, Dr. Sanjay would like to come back in since he's working more at the, at the regional level. But, I mean, uh, usually uh, recovery strategies are often uh, national. But uh, we are working mainly on prevention. Uh, when we talk about protecting ecosystems, it's we really want to reduce the impact of the disaster. And of course, ecosystems are also critical for recovery. When you have a healthy ecosystem um, and you may need to rely on that forest, you may need to rely. It's a privilege to welcome uh, Gary D. Lake Pomerai, a British citizen presently based in Kathmandu, Nepal. He's a project consultant for water resource management and enhancement and water associated needs and project development consultant for advanced earthquake early warning. His primary goal is to identify the challenges and to ensure we coordinate the most efficient strategy from within technology, social science, government, administration, and the UN to provide effective, sustainable, and resilient solution now. Independent disaster risk reduction consultant to UN, ISDR, UNESCO, UNCRD, EAC. Besides that, uh, he was also the program advocate for INRULD, Education for Rural Development and Sustainability, and to IFRC for legislative mechanism to support the integration of DRR with H&S. In 2009, Till 2009 to present, uh, he was promoted AEEWS development of the Advanced Earthquake Early Warning System and supported primary wave EEWS development since 2009 assignment at Global EEWS System and their implementations. He was also advocate and field implementation scientist practicing and publishing for water resource management strategies. He was the chair of UNESCO Global Task Force for the Built Environment. He was a co-founder of the Coalition of Global School Safety. And also, as I mentioned, that he was associated with, he's presently also associated with the UN, UNICEF, MENADR, and UNISDR. We welcome you, sir. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Can you please enable the camera, sir? Can you, hmm? can you video. raise your... Yes, we can hear you, sir. Right. What would you like me to do? I can't see you. Ah. Well, my... My... My, my camera is, is on. And I've got, a, I've got a picture in my bottom right-hand corner. But that doesn't particularly matter. Can we raise the slides, please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Slides. Okay, let's go straight to that. Right, excellent. And I'll just ask you to go to the next slide when I wish. Um, okay, so my whole approach today is that I'm going to be one of the dots. We're talking about joining dots, but I'm going to uh, uh, address one of the dots within this whole process of building uh, resilience and sustainability within disaster risk reduction. So I'm concentrating today on earthquakes and I think, one second, I think there is an unmuted, or there's an unmuted, there's a lot of noise in the background there. Uh, maybe that's slightly better. Okay, so let's, uh, let's just start from here. Now, I really want to target the students because we have a, a fair number of students listening in today and that was one of our targets and I thank Dr. Ishitoshi for, for inviting me to this because targeting students for future research is really absolutely vital. Right? So we can, we can lecture as much as we want but we do need the future generations to participate in being part of that solution. Um, to build this resilience and sustainability. Now, earthquakes themselves are obviously a devastating event, and they always, to date, take us by surprise. So let's go to the next step, next slide, please. Okay, so the enormity of the risk of life uh, by earthquakes um, has been recognized, and even though the majority of disastrous events are meteorologically based, 
the majority of casualties are in fact still being caused by um, earthquakes and associated tsunamis. So that is one of the big challenges that we've, to date, we've never really had the opportunity to make ourselves resilient apart from physical uh, building codes and so forth to try and build our environment stronger to earthquakes, but we've never been able to build that resilience in the same way as we can within uh, meteorological events, who, who, who very successfully over the last sort of 20 and 30 years have developed this um, early warning process of understanding the meteorological approach of, of storms and cyclones and so forth, and therefore um, have built this resilience and, and Bangladesh is one of those prime examples. I remember as a child, you know, on an annual basis, 50, 60,000 people would be, uh, would be become casualties and, and, and die uh, with, the, with the monsoon scenario, uh, cyclones hitting them head on. Nowadays, you know, we're, 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 we're surprised or I mean, we're thankful that it is literally hundreds in, in the year and not tens of thousands. So we built that resilience um, and, and, and that is beneficial. However, with earthquakes, we have a, a bigger problem. Next slide, please. Okay, so just looking at the costs of an earthquake, um, and this is research from 1994. So this is a, you know, so these figures are a, a gross underestimate of what we would expect for today, but it gives an indication that even though, you know, without the dead on arrival or the top line here or dying in hospital, the costs are phenomenal for towards society. And that's either through insurance or, or off work. And it's a, this, this, this is a, a complicated calculation, but showing that, you know, out of the two billion casualty costs, you know, there's, 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 there's at least a, a one billion for the survivors, and that is significant. You know, this is the, this is one of the challenges of of of, of the geophys hazards. Um, that, that it's not simply what happens on the day; it's it's going beyond that in the future years of the recovery, because earthquakes are decimate absolutely decimate the the epicentral zone, and and damage and be and damage beyond that, which I'll touch on in a moment. Can I go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> next slide. Yeah, thanks. Right. Oh, oh no, no, no. Back one. Back one. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, yes. Now, you know, so we've not uh, not only got the cost of casualties, but with the cost of assets as well. The seventy-one trillion dollars worth of asset built environment at risk to earthquakes across the across mother earth all right so all, all within the seismic uh, risk zones 71 trillion dollars worth you know the, the and and just over this last uh, 20 years um we've identified you know the significant cost for earthquakes 21 percent of 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 uh, disasters and, and, and the costs of disasters on, on these annual bases um, are, are due to earthquakes. And we continue to have within Asia over a trillion dollars worth of, um, of, uh, of losses uh, just within um, in, in Asia itself. Now, these asset costs are going to increase. Our housing costs are going up, materials are going up, you know, um, uh, all the resources necessary for our environment of where we live are increasing on an annual basis and very quickly at that as well. So, and of course, within economic development, even within developing countries, their costs are going to increase each and every time that they uh, uh, receive a, uh, a, a geophys disaster. And, you know, in uh, the Gorka earthquake, for Nepal alone, it was estimated about $5 billion, the cost to the country as a whole. And, you know, that, uh, that will increase if we make a comparison of a similar event in future, we know that's going to increase. So how do we address this? And uh, to the next slide, please.
uh, a click. Next slide. That's it. Well, I think that's yeah. I think that's the one. Okay. So, <clears throat> disaster disaster risk reduction, resilience, and sustainability applied to earthquakes. Well, risk risk reduction. You know, we, let's just look at. I think we've jumped a slide. Can we go back one slide? So I want to, the risk reduction slide. Is it one slide back. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. So risk reduction is deemed to be a measure that reduces the severity of losses in life, livelihood and, and asset damage. This is really important for us to, to understand uh, applied to earthquakes. Right? Earthquakes are spontaneous events and, and which to date, you know, very little pre-event warning. And, the, and that's the only uh, risk reduction that can be applied is preparedness. Right? Um, and within and uh, within preparedness, you know, the, we are limited with the amount of um, uh, early warning that uh, we've been capable of producing in this last uh, 15, 20 years to around 10 to 60 seconds. Okay, so in the form of you know preparedness in the form of building stronger to building codes and in the right place, right? And I've been into Balakot into in in. Uh, in Kashmir, and 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 seeing you know communities literally built across the fault line, and in the 2005 earthquake there, the the shift in the ground, the rise in the ground was two meters, right? And yet the community continued to live there because they don't have many choices. That's another conversation. But you know, building in the right place for any type of disaster is or potential um, uh, 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 event. Is, is so important. Preparing society by practice, uh, you know, to whatever early warning uh, system time generation, um, effectively to minimize uh, injury and the loss of life. Really, we've only been capable of, of looking at the reducing the loss of life within those 60 seconds by duck cover and hold and, 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 and then a quick evacuation afterwards prior to um, um, aftershocks. But to date, you know, P wave early warning systems offer only seconds to respond and, and problematically omit the most vulnerable to life loss and asset damage in the blind zone of the 25 to 30 kilometer radius from that epicenter. Consequently, any early warning system providing significantly more warning than that also embraces the epicentral zone uh, will significantly contribute to earthquake risk reduction. So this is absolutely you know, vital because I want, I'm building up to where we bring the future research into, right? So next slide, please. Okay. <clears throat> there is a, a time delay here. Do we have the next slide? Resilience. Is it fine, sir? No, it's not. Mine's not moving. <laughs> it's not moving, Trinidad. No. Uh, uh, now we've gone. We've gone one too many. One back, please. One back. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. There we go. Resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from a crisis with minimal effect upon life or livelihood or the wider uh, uh, or the wider economy and social activities. Resilience to any adverse event can only be generated if you are aware of the risk and its potential, right? So that's essential in all communities. You have, a prepare, you have prepared your environment to survive the event, so you've, you've, you've minimized um, adverse potential uh, consequences of, of, of in your surrounding environment, and crisis management plans are designed and implemented. Very essential within commerce, essential within communities and within schools and hospitals, critical infrastructure. The society is psychologically prepared, right, and given opportunity to respond intelligently. That, 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 that might sound um, uh, strange, but, you know, if, if, you, if you're caught totally by surprise, psychologically, you, you, you end up panicking. But if we're able to prepare society psychologically that we are living in seismic events and that we can p 
prepare them to respond far more quickly. But we have to, in order to, for them to respond intelligently, we've got to give them sufficient early warning to make a decision of where, what they do in their circumstance, whether they're on the back of a motorbike, in a vehicle, or in their place of work, or at their home, or in a school, all right? So we have to give them the time. This, this generally can only happen in response to a crisis event if effective early warning systems are in place and society is trained to respond efficiently. The present 60 seconds provided within earthquake early warning P-wave systems in some countries, and not all countries have that uh, benefit, offers little to contribute to resilience, all right? So next slide, please. It's next one, sir. Uh, we want the sustainability one. We've got a, a time lap again. Right, thank you. Right, um, okay, and, and just to touch on this, you know, in the in, in sustainability is the ab ab ability to maintain and survive through expansion and economic and event crises as a continued at a continued rate of positive development. So sustainability is very different from just resilience. Okay, so investment within a conscientious building inspection with a conscientious, a conscientious building inspection, continued society training, emergency response development, and continuity planning across you know all of commerce. Um, from individual to income, subsistence to corporates, and government and critical infrastructure, all right? Recovery is planned and prepared from a worst case scenario. We must address worst case scenario. All this would be greatly enhanced if early warning um, offers sufficient time to respond by protecting life through organized evacuations, securing protectable assets before the event which to date has not been possible for earthquakes. Right, now we get to the interesting point. I've set the, set the scene. Next slide, please. It's next one. That's it, thank you very much. Okay, so what's been developed over the last 15, 20 years, and originally it was um, uh, initiated from within uh, NASA with, by uh, uh, my, one of my colleagues, and then broke free at the end of 2009 to 2013 from NASA, and we've developed this um, from from uh, from then onwards. And I've been working with these these group of scientists for the last uh, 12, 13 years. Now, an advanced earthquake early warning system, and I and I hinge on the process of system because it's all very well generating an alarm, but if no one know if it can't be communicated. So if we don't have front and back end, then it can't be communicated and therefore people cannot respond to it, all right? So the critical, the, 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 the critical point is this, that whilst I also assisted the Chinese in developing their P-wave early warning system, in parallel, I was assisting this group of scientists working on a, on a, on a, on a far higher level of not prediction or forecasting or statistics, but looking at the genesis of the earthquake. Now, the, the, what we've developed and what we're beginning to implement now is, 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 a, is, a, is a process that we identify the epicenter, we confirm the magnitude, we provide the precise time window. So we can say days in advance, three, four days in advance of exactly where the uh, epicenter is going to be, its magnitude, and the time in, on the Friday afternoon is going to be between two o'clock and five o'clock. Um, and provides in, and also we're able through precursors, and I'll explain that in a moment, um, we're able to look at up to, you know, 30 days, 21 to 30 days of actually an emerging potential event, right? So we, we are actually seeing precursors of anomalies through satellite and ground sensors and so forth that yet yeah, this looks like a, a, a location which is heating up for a potential rupture. And then we're able to guarantee and confirm this, you know, up to five days in advance when a particular event happens, which is the genesis of the earthquake. Next slide, please. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, 
<laughs> no, not yet. Oh, there it is. Thank you very much. Okay, so okay, very, just touching very quickly on the science, so so we actually fits in because I don't want to sort of concentrate on this so much. But what is actually happening from the hypercenter? A resonance is being generated as a seismic gravity wave. It resonates across the Earth and meets on the other side. It returns as a KY wave, and it returns guaranteed to the epicenter. Right. So between the epicenter and, and hypercenter. And, and, and by the network of stations globally, which our bottom left-hand um, uh, uh, corner uh, picture shows, you know, and, and these, these sensors, we only require about 250, 300 sensors globally, uh, unlike the 7,500 uh, seismic sensors that China uh, have installed for their P-wave early warning. So we only require a very limited number of sensors because they're picking up the KY wave on its return. And then it's pure trigonometry. Analysis is complicated, but it's pure trigonometry. So we're monitoring the whole process. We're looking at the advanced awareness of an impending event. We get that confirmation. And then during those last uh, uh, five, five, three, four days, we're actually able to pr precisely uh, uh, trigger a warning with a 95 plus guarantee. Right. So this is this is not prediction. It's not forecasting as the precursors. This is understanding the exact genesis of the earthquake. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much. OK, so primary benefits and we'll whip through these. You know, this should start to initiate some thought process of the students on future opportunities which have never been available uh, before. So removing the persons from risk environments. So if we've got three, four, five days in advance, and guaranteed that the event is going to happen on Friday afternoon. You know, do we do we evacuate people on uh, four days in advance? No, we don't, because we know the exact time of the event, but we can prepare for it. And I'll just touch on that. Enable domestic possessions and commercial goods protection. So anything that is protectable, we're able to remove and 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 remove either from the the epicentral zone or protected in packaging and so on and so forth, getting it into the open. Developing resilience and continuity within communities and commerce. So establishing a robust society to, to, to earthquakes. So the target benefits include triggering NDMAs to activate pre-event preparedness strategies, you know, minimizing strategies using advanced warning, so and reducing urban and rural domestic and livelihood losses absolutely essential if we're having that continuity of life po uh, post event right um instigating proactive crisis management so every sector of society is aware that this is going to happen and we can respond in a variety of different ways uh, which is a subject all by itself or which requires future research on what is best what's best practice and then mobilizing advanced protection of cultural and heritage infrastructure. And this is where the engineers potentially come in. Next slide, please. So where the, en where the engineers need to come in is, 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 uh, is, is understanding, OK, now I've got four days of, of warning. What can I do to protect our, our, our critical infrastructure, our, our domestic infrastructure, and our commercial infrastructure, and, the, and, and our you know, heritage? What can we do within that as a temporary measure? You know, and it, and fl literally potentially fly it in, um, if if necessary, with those three four days advance warning. And of course, population preparedness with advance warning is is absolutely critical. No, we're not going to evacuate people days in advance, but we can do on that Friday morning because we know it's going to happen in the afternoon. All right, and this is so, this is so exciting. You know, I I imagine most of you are thinking this is not possible, but it is. We we've got it. We've been proving this over the last. Uh, 15 years and, and 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 putting it into practice at different levels um, at, at uh, last so six or seven years and and we've proven it um, and and now we're putting it together as a complete package starting as a regional level. So you know orderly evacuations where we can put we can put hospital event uh, 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 facilities and health facilities up because we will already have existing ill people who continue to need to be treated even from within their homes. So and 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 shelter because you know even if we evacuate we could be in the middle of a winter somewhere it could we could be a foot in deep in snow and and 
and and and it, you know, or we could be in the middle of a monsoon. So we need protection. We can't just tell people to walk out into the outside. And a coordinated assembly. We don't want people rushing. It's not a mass exodus. So it may be all phased over a period of hours and and and, and the day before. And and of course we can bus people. And for the most vulnerable, if we know where the epicenters are going to be, we can take the most vulnerable people out of the epicenter and re relieving them of any risk whatsoever. Next slide, please. And, and so, you know, traditionally, uh, earthquakes fall into a, a variety of cat categories, health and safety, psychological fairness, activation emergency plans, organizational site-specific action. But, you know, we've, we're adding to this now, asset protection and mitigation of loss. And there are billions of dollars that, that, of, of, of losses. And, and, and I'll, I'll show you a slide in a second. And pre-event modeling. Once we know that the, the event is going to be in a particular location, and we even know offshore locations. So we we, we know it's, it, it, we don't need sensors on the ocean floor to know exact location of where that's going to be. It's trigonometry from all the stranding sensors on land, right? So, um, uh, so we, we can create modeling for this, for tsunamis and for, for landslides and for all sorts. We, 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 we can focus immediately. It's not, we're not being taken by surprise. And also, we, this, the whole system is able to, to protect on a watch guard of giving us minutes to hours on, on individual major aftershocks as well. So that is and so enormously important for, for the, the NGOs and for the response and for and, and potential search and rescue where people didn't evacuate, you know, didn't believe it was going to happen. Whatever the case is, they still need, potentially need to be rescued. And there's those rescuers that we have an obligation to protect as well. Next slide, please. Okay. <clears throat> Now, you know, within just just look at these pictures. These are familiar pictures from newsreels of which we see that enormous amount of damage and destruction. Not the shelves have not fallen over on the left hand side in the retail, but all the items have come off. And and that's where the, co the cost of the shelves are a, a, a few hundred dollars. The cost of what's on the floor there runs into thousands of dollars. And if you put that across a whole city, uh, you know, a, a mega city, for argument's sake, which is being struck. With a hypercenter, uh, uh, epicenter in, the, in its center, would would you know would be millions and potentially billions of dollars of 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 protectable assets which could have been protected if they had you know that that those two or three days in advance um, early warning and of course within the office and the domestic you know the amount of losses within a private um, um, and personal domestic environments is an, is enormous as well and it really does hit home because this is the private this is the personal items which psychologically affect us most of all most of us are not too worried about the retail because they we assume they're all insured but most but our p personal items you know that's what hurts us over 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 the, the future years. We've lost what we, was critical to us. Next slide, please. Okay. Thank you very much. So, in summary, you know what we what we what, what we really want to be looking at now is the best way of using this time. All right, students, if you're listening, please. You know what is the best way? How can we protect our protectable? Uh, infrastructure, our protectable antiquities, our protectable um, assets within the home and within the, within uh, uh, commerce, within retail, warehousing, and so on and so forth. And and what are going to be the best methods of of controlling and evacuating people into open spaces? We don't necessarily have to bust them all 50 miles away, but we may well we 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 have to identify our open spaces within our communities of which we, you know this is the place we will put people and how do we get tentage and, and, and weather protection into those locations so we now have the, the advanced earthquake early warning now potentially transforms earthquake mitigation and preparedness by combining the various precursor observation methods you know the the the, the, the discovery of and the and the, the actual and capability of analysis of the seismic gravity wave is a game changer there's no no question about it you know it was being looked at for for, for for decades but no one had the ability to to capture it within sensors and then had the capability of analyzing it and we can d have the distinctions between volcanoes and earthquakes so even earthquakes even volcanoes should never be uh, uh, be being caught by surprise in the future and um 
And then the numerous oppor oppor opportunities of mitigation saving billions of dollars and thousands of lives. We should not actually need to, to, to experience casualties in the future, right? So, and, 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 and finally, the further potentially encouraging the reduction of the protection gap. So that there are any econ e economic students here, you know, looking at insurance and how we apply insurance to the environment and, and to society, that protection gap is enormous at this present time. The vast majority of people are not protected. So, and there are all sorts of schemes and formats of, of, of insurance which can now be applied very successfully and, 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 and safely if we know this knowledge in advance. So uh, AWS uh, offers a whole new landscape creating personal economic opportunity as a true game changer within the earthquake preparedness and mitigation, potentially generating previously unachievable resilience to earthquakes. Interestingly, I work in water as well, and I'm now, I, this is, this, uh, you just come to the last slide, please. I come to, to, to water. My whole perspective since the last 15 years, and in fact, I was a search and rescue technician for, for 15 years as well, previously, but by getting involved with the UN, I was part of the strategists of writing the strategy and policy, understanding where the challenges were. And one of the things that we realized was that we were not bringing the science to the solutions. We needed the science. And that's where I have concentrated. And, you know, and, and we, we have all the answers out here, <laughs> but, but we don't necessarily have the political will. And as of course, there's a lot of commercial competition out there and people will convince you that you know, the sun won't rise tomorrow morning if they think it's commercially advantageous to them. So you know, I, I thank you for the opportunity today. We've taken a bit of time, but this is so important. This is so important as a game changer that we need this, the young scientists to be thinking, right, how do we benefit from this? How do we apply it? And how do we look at developing the opportunities of this for the future years? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. Gary, for uh, sharing your profound knowledge. And as you mentioned earlier, the, in the beginning that you wanted to target the young scholars, I must extend my serious gratitude to you for elaborating the concept of risk reduction, resilience, and sustainability in a very uh, broad way. As you correctly mentioned that uh, the time factor is very important for early warning system. By focusing on the advanced early warning system, we can indeed uh, save uh, billions of rupees rather than during, uh, making a future investment. It is a wise idea to save the, uh, that amount of money uh, much before. Um, I think one scholar uh, has raised a uh, is you can unmute yourself, Kushani. Yes, I, I think Kushani. it's Kushani Merengage. I'd allowed to. Yes, you're allowed to speak. You can unmute yourself. Please, uh, Kushani. Access has been. Yeah, mute yourself. Yes. Yeah, you can hear me now. I guess. Yes. Yes. Yeah? Can, yes. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for the impressive presentation. It was very informative and impressive. Uh, since I'm actually working on uh, early warning systems, which is my PhD thesis, I have developed uh, strategies on the four pillars. And some of the pillars that you have already mentioned, um, like risk knowledge for preparedness, uh, monitoring and warning service for preparedness, and dissemination communication with the technology, that is, that is what was missing. Then the fourth one, community responding capacity with the gender equity aspect. So those are the four pillars under which I have developed a strategic framework for my PhD uh, last year. And uh, my particular the question particularly uh, focusing on the aspect that you mentioned improving the psychological preparedness of the people. Mm -hmm. I really love to hear that. That is something that had gone missing uh, all these years. But I'm now so happy to see that it's coming as part and parcel of the overall early warning systems. Not it is not applicable just to earthquake early warning but also to other all other hazards I would say um, in that regard are you uh, specifically focusing the improving psychological resilience or the psychological preparedness of the vulnerable people or is it applicable to the decision makers as well well in, in, in all answer 
to answer your comprehensive question, because you know that's an enormous subject. It applies to everybody, right? It's the psychological the psychological effects of events upon people is enormous and lasts for years. If we are able to dampen that by 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 preparedness and advanced warning is capturing people by surprise which affects them mm -hmm. because they can't protect they feel helpless towards their family their friends their children and so forth but if if in advance we know that an event is going to happen like the cyclone we know cyclones are coming in wmo have worked exceptionally hard on developing their whole process of early warning now, obviously, there are people who ignore that. But the fact is, the psychological side of meteorological events now has, has, has dampened the adverse effect upon the individual over the last 20, 20 30 years. We want to do the same with, with, with seismic uh, events. We want to bring the seismic event to the same level as a meteorological event, and it is becoming an event. I, you notice I'm not using the word disaster, all right? It may still be an economic disaster because we cannot as yet protect all the infrastructure, but we can now potentially protect all the living creatures, including the humans and livestock and so forth. So that is the significant, that was where the psychological effect of we're taking the steam out of the event and, you know, by working with people like yourselves, and this is what I'm wanting to encourage, the thought processes on this, on how we actually apply it. Because when we have 30 million people in, in, in Nepal, for argument's sake, all vulnerable to earthquakes, we have a lot of work to do, all right? But, you know, we need yeah. to do that research first of all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kushani. And thank you, uh, Gary D. Love Pomeroy. Thank you so much, sir, once again, for sharing very technical issues related to early warning system. and uh, giving us your innovative ideas. Thank you once again. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. May I, may I now take a privilege to uh, invite our next speaker, N. Loy Rigu. Loy Rigu is a practitioner with 40 years of leadership and technical work on governance, program development and implementation on disaster preparedness, risk reduction, resilience and adoption to man-made and natural risk and their mainstreaming into sustainable development, particularly in partnership building, advocacy, mobilization and action at regional, national, sub-national, city and community level. He worked five years with Tata Motors, 10 years with India's National Safety Council as Joint Director and 15 years with the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center in Bangkok as Director and later he joined as Deputy ED, partnering with international and regional organizations, national and local govern governments, civil societies and labor organizations, Red Cross, increasing private sector and develop part development partners. Since 2011, he serves as technical advisor and volunteer in U.S., Myanmar, Egypt, and India on DPRR, Rio 20, the Sustainable Development Goals, and other international agendas of 2015-16. to 16. He worked to establish the MARS Practitioners Network in 2012 and VERVE -E Volunteers Program in 2014. His three degrees are BTEC from Indian Institute of Technology, Mumbai, Safety from Central Labor Institute, both in Bombay, and an LLB in law from Pune, and specialized short-term courses on disaster management. We are very sure, sir, that we are going to gain more innovative ideas through your uh, lecture. May I please invite you to address the gathering? Yeah, it's... Uh... Uh, first of all, I'll ask you to put up the slides, but it's a pleasure and honor to to participate in the webinar, even though it's taken so long to reach where we are. But I'm glad we've, we've chosen the time wisely. So if we put it to full size, what I'm going to speak to you today is on both being prepared for disasters and resilience building at various levels in the country. Uh, and both in India as well as all of South Asia. 
and secondly how it makes an impact positively if we can get it right on sustainable development so resilience is an integral part of sustainable development and the sendai framework is a good ally to the sfdrr if this is what we are going to achieve so let's look at the eight countries we intend to serve can we go to the next slide okay sir it's next one sir so it it's yeah this one so the eight south asian countries which all of you know afghanistan bangladesh bhutan india maldives pakistan nepal and sri lanka they differ widely in size starting from india with 1.3 million population uh, and uh, a huge uh, land mass followed by pakistan uh, bangladesh afghanistan the fourth largest country then nepal sri lanka uh, bhutan and bhutan and maldives so both in terms of populations at risk as well as clusters in different geographical locations we see certain patterns and this is part of a larger study uh, of com doing comparative analysis of these eight countries so if we take uh, india 50% is under 25 years we have 2000 ethnic groups in the country we have multiple regions both the himalayan mountain region tropical rainforest the delta plains in the south we have 29 states and nine union territories six zones 741 districts and this is a huge uh, you know broadband to address compared to that we have bangladesh with a high higher percentage of of uh, bengali muslims but 8.2% hindus the largest delta in the world the ganga brahmana megaputra river delta and 110 rivers and tributaries 64 districts 492 sub districts 12 cities aiming to achieve middle income status by this year we have pakistan which was actually the second 64% live in rural areas you have five broad geographical regions and uh, we we are talking about uh, five provinces where each of which has impact we are talking about nepal afghanistan sri lanka which was impacted by both the tsunami as well as periodic uh, cyclones sorry not cyclones but uh, droughts and floods and nine provinces 25 districts 331 division and uh, under 14000 gram niladri divisions we also need to look at bhutan and the maldives as two environmental hotspots in the region at risk from climate change and need to tackle them though they may appear small they are they are complex and they in each of their cases is a key to preserve having an environmentally protect protecting their environment and preserving their their future next slide please so can we go to the next slide so we we face both hello yes sir is it yes, sir yes sir just move move the slide yeah no 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 you've gone too far go back up go back one so we face both unnatural hazards and anthropogenic disasters both flooding erosion cyclones storm surges droughts landslide avalanches tsunamis earthquakes sea level rise extreme temperature and of course what we are currently experiencing the epidemics equally well we have industrial disasters chemical nuclear biological and radiological disasters and unfortunately in the areas of south asia conflict which impact next slide okay sir if we look at the six countries which i have chosen to focus on we see 335 earthquakes in in afghanistan alone over the last 30 years a huge impact of drought 
So there's a, there are figures given on the area affected. We see floods impacting and causing economic da damage. Avalanche deaths, 2,700 annually. We look at the impact of cyclones in Bangladesh, some of the major ones uh, to floods and even a major building collapse, the Rana Plaza collapse, which caused uh, uh, 1,100 deaths uh, seven years ago. Cyclones impact over the last 40 years, 520,000 deaths and land areas inundated even during a normal monsoon. India faces major disasters and these are both when we say 431 major disasters it may sound small but major disasters in this case is talking about the big ones. Pakistan also is impacted by hydromet disasters and in fact the earthquake risk was not as well understood but once the 2005 Kashmir earthquake occurred they have reorganized and re-energized effective disaster risk management. Droughts continue to impact Sindh and Balochistan and require to be tackled. Nepal faces regular monsoonal pre precipitation, of course catastrophic earthquakes and unfortunately even droughts, landslides and it's got its own peculiar disaster called GLOF, Glo global glacial uh, lake outbursts causing floods. So. Uh, so to Sri Lanka had the tsunami is impacted by flood cyclones as well as the worst drought of 40 years. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So here we look at the three major no 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 you've gone too one, far ahead or behind this one this one this yes. one this one that's fine no next one sorry Next one, please. Implement, yeah. So here we see that each of these countries is focused on each of the three. We do tackle both disasters through disaster management agencies. We have climate change agencies who are working on climate change. And of course, sustainable development agencies across the whole of government. So we look at each of the three. Afghanistan, and, and Bangladesh are two of the earliest countries to set up disaster management agencies. DDP, Department of Disaster uh, Prevention, was set up as early as 1973. Bangladesh set up its own ministry almost 50 years ago, the Ministry of Disaster Management and Response. And other countries have set up major agencies later. India set up in, in uh, uh, 2005. So to Sri Lanka, Pakistan in 2006, and Nepal most recently on a wide scale. And I've listed out the agencies there. You can read a little more about them. And this is the future because these have to be built up in the ways in which they can deliver effectively, not just on response, but equally well on prevention programs, on preparedness programs, and on risk reduction programs. Separately, unfortunately, we have the climate change agencies. And fortunately, we have national climate change committees or ministries of environment focusing on uh, these subjects in each of the countries. We have, for example, in India, a PM's Council on Climate Change with a range of stakeholders. We have the Pakistan Climate Change Council chaired by the Prime Minister. Nepal has set up a recent climate change policy and the Ministry of Environment in Sri Lanka has set up the Climate Change Secretariat which is delivering on various outputs which I'll share with you in, the, in, a, in a subsequent slide. All this is linked to sustainable development across multiple agencies and we see that uh, both disaster management and climate change are part of building resilience and uh, sustainability. So if we look at the SDGs, we, 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 we are talking about the multi-ministerial executive committee under the cabinet headed by the president. We are talking about the Bangladesh Planning Commission 
which is actually a very effective agency. We're talking about Niti Aayog in India, the replacement of the Planning Commission. We're talking about the SDG Secretariat in the National Assembly in Pakistan, which is mainstreaming SDGs into the federal ministries and the subnational uh, mechanisms. We have a National Planning Commission, which is increasingly motivated and uh, working effectively in Nepal. And Sri Lanka, early on, post tsunami in particular, and uh, subsequently in terms of uh, work on a separate, separate work by a separate ministry, providing leadership to sustainable development. Next slide, please. Yeah. So e each of the countries has set up and taken the leadership on development. So I'm first going to focus on the work done in terms of establishing policies and legislation on SDGs, as well as SDG plans. So Afghanistan set up and in fact has effectively allied their SDG planning and development with building peace. And of course, today Afghanistan is in a, its own uh, situation, but it's important to recognize what they have built up and that cannot be washed away and it has to be built upon. Bangladesh set up a vision 2021 to build economic growth, reduce poverty and social development and has been work, working on this national SD strategy for the last 11 years uh, and has integrated it within their five-year plans. India talks of Sapka Saat, Sapka Vikas and the Niti Aayog is fast tracking the SDGs, both in terms of a three-year action agenda, 2017 to 2020, a 15-year vision and a seven-year strategy with active participation of the subnational governments. So we have in India very effective documents, periodic dialogues with the chief secretaries and uh, a good set of progress reports, but much more needs to be done. And I, I endorse what uh, Sanjay Srivastav said that as a region, we are far, far behind. But at the same time, in terms of achieving goals, we are far, far behind. In terms of setting up institutions, we have set up these right institutions. We need to empower and uh, help them reshape. Pakistan set up its vision 2025 in 2014 and has now a more effective water policy responsible consumption and production of forest policy and is aiming clearly to build a one nation, one vision fully aligned with the SDGs. Nepal too has a SDG status and roadmap which it reported to as a voluntary national review in the high level political forum in 2017. Sri Lanka, of course, the previous president set up the Mahinda Chintana, which was well before the, uh, uh, well before the SDG started and subsequently have set up and with the current president also a sustainable development act he's the brother of of the previous president uh, sri lanka has an effective national council for sustainable development a cabinet ministry on sustainable development and is aiming to build inclusive transformation in terms of a national plan for for sdgs so too we can see work done by uh, nepal Next slide, please. This slide, next slide. Can we move one slide ahead? So here you, you can see, no, 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 ahead. Ahead, ahead, one more. Yeah. So here you can get a, a short overview of disaster management legislation and active plans at the national and subnational level, as well as climate change, environment policy and legislation, and the uh, nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement. So let me take each one of them separately. So if we talk about disaster management legislation, there is a law in, in uh, Afghanistan and uh, an effective plan 2015 so to Bangladesh is one of the earliest to have set up an act uh, and, and not, not an act, but standing orders, which they used very effectively 
to create mechanisms at the national level. It's one of the earliest South Asian countries. But now they have more ambitiously linked their work on SFDRR with the Bangladesh Delta Plan for uh, 80 years, right up to 2100, and have incorporated disaster management thinking and risk reduction thinking and resilience building into that plan. India, both our prime minister's 10-point agenda and the national disaster management plan articulated in 2016 and revised in 2019 help us implement both our act and the national policy on disaster management. And you can see, more importantly, it has created SPMAs and DDMAs which effectively deliver on the changes that are needed. As I said, in Pakistan, the Earthquake Reconstruction and Rehabilitation Authority, ERA, was what helped transform. And a new act was passed in 2010, especially with the impact of the floods. And now they have an effective national disaster management plan right up to 2022. And multi-hazard early warning system, CBDRM, and a national roadmap right up to 2030. Nepal, certainly with the impact of the earthquake, which helped accelerate the new government into rethinking, is effectively focusing on local disaster and climate resilience building. In fact, it's linking the two. It set up a new Disaster Risk Management Act, building on the earlier one, and it is developing and uh, is taking up for implementation the strategic action plan which it developed in 2017-2018 right up to 2030. Sri Lanka's Disaster Management Act I mentioned it was one of the first to set up a, a long-term roadmap and this has been revised and strengthened. If we take action on climate change also there's a full list of, of uh, uh, progress made and I will not go into the detail here because of limited time. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, sir. So, so where are we in terms of building uh, on advocacy, which is what we need to do, both communicating how we can help communities, local authorities, subnational governments in taking up work to the next level, to building up right up to the national level. Implementation support, both through projects and programs, but also regularizing work in the normal traditions of government. We need to use both government funding as well as multi-donor uh, funding from multiplicity of donors. Capacity building of our national institutions and technical uh, guidance as well as exercises both for preparedness planning, early warning. We need to plan and build mitigation. We need to think through our finance and HR plans and our community mobilizing plan. I've talked about capacity building. How do we institutionalize? We don't need to think only of project work, but our pilot project work, which is unfortunately the dominant way in which we work. But how do we continue the work that we began under a project? How do we scale up? How do we sustain? How do we find local sources of support? How do we build it into our government mechanisms and be creative where needed, including advocating and empowering volunteer action? And routinizing, this is a surprising word that many people are surprised by, but we need to routinize disaster management and build it into the normal work of government as well as mobilize all the sectors who need to work in partnership if we are to deliver results. So let us look finally at what are the challenges we face. Moving to the next slide. Can we? Yeah. So we need, we, there are many challenges and this is not an easy task. After all, this is, I won't say a hundred year agenda but it will certainly take its own time in our country as well as the other countries of the region. So we need to think both sub-nationally, we need to think nationally, we need to think 
regionally, quite apart from the global. And we need within the country to work, learn from innovations at the local level, at the sub-national level at, and at the regional level. Fortunately, we have the NDMA awarding innovation and we need to build on it. We need to focus on creating solutions and fine-tuning them. We need to build livelihoods that are risk resilient. We need to be prepared for risks and not just aim to reduce them, but integrate resilience into all our development actions. We, we need very importantly not to work, work in two parallel tracks on disaster management and climate change, but to link with climate change adaptation, environmental management, biodiversity, and more importantly, to, re, to ensure that our approach to sustainable development integrates resilience building into each of the SDGs. And I would say that while some SDGs focus on uh, uh, building resilience, you'll find that resilience is applicable in each of the SDGs. We need to look at, recognize the challenges of scale. We need to think beyond projects and sustain and expand them and routinize them. We need to recognize the power of local government. Don't leave everything to the national government. We need to look at the private sector and partner with them. We need to work with local NGOs as well as their international partners. We need to build volunteer organizations and volunteers who are as local as possible, not just in disaster response, which uh, people, people do normally respond from the goodwill of their hearts, but to work with them on a regular routine basis in building the resilience of communities. And uh, we need to recognize, empower, and value successful routinization. And you, you, you may be surprised at this term, but we need to make regularize and simplify and move away from projects into routine activity. This is when we will be most successful. So I'm happy to answer questions and provide more examples if there are questions that have come. I haven't looked at the questions that have come. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful uh, speech. Uh, as we are running short of time, I would quickly ask one question raised by a participant. Uh, sea level rise is a major threat to the island national Maldives. Do they have any climate change agency there? Uh, yes, yes. So. Uh, I, I don't have the, uh, yes, they do have a Ministry for Climate Change. In fact, they are, <laughs> the current President of the General Assembly, whom I listened to yesterday, is the Maldives Chair of the, of the Gen UN General Assembly of the whole world. Uh, and they will go underwater if there is climate change. So they are deeply conscious of it. They have uh, very active efforts because they have only a, a meter of height which protects them. And we need to help them and help the Maldives in our region because it's the most impacted by climate change. These are pristine atolls. I've been there once only. I would love to go back. But more importantly, these are a beautiful part of the world that we have in our sub-region. And we need to ensure that we retain it and we build it up. So, yes, climate change is a crucial uh, threat to the Maldives and uh, is something that we need, is, is one of the regions, one of the countries in our region that is most threatened by climate change. Thank you so much, sir, for giving us a lot of information about the Asian countries and also highlighting the role of the stakeholders at grassroots level and their coordination with local and uh, uh, level. That coordination is very important. Uh, now, as we are running short of time, may I take the honor to invite the patron of the international webinar, Professor Arka Kumar Das Mohapatra, 
Professor Mahapatra is the Vice Chancellor of Odisha State Open University at present. Before taking over as the Vice Chancellor of Odisha State Open University, he was working in Sambalpur University as the senior most professor of business administration and the chairman post graduate council. Professor Das Mahapatra has over 32 years of teaching and research experience to his credit. He was the Vice Chancellor in charge of Sambalpur University. He has also discharged several administrative responsibilities of Sambalpur University such as the Director, UGC Human Resource Development Center, Director Distance and Continuing Education, Controller of Finance, Officer on Special Duty, Head Department of Business Administration, Dean School of Management Studies, Member Syndicate, Senate Academic Council, Research Degree Committee, Examination Committee and Regulation Amending Committee, besides being the member of Board of Studies. Professor Das Mahapatra has served the Assam University and the Assam Institute of Management, Gohati as well. He is Fellow of Royal Society of Arts, London, Fellow World Business Institute, Australia, and is the life member of Indian Society of Training and Development, Indian Accounting Association, Indian Commerce Association, Indian Social Science Congress, and nominated member of American Biographic Research Institute. I take this privilege to invite you, sir. Over to you. Thank you very much, sir, Dr. Anupama. Greetings to you all. key patron of this international webinar on disaster risk reduction, resilience, and sustainability. Uh, Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal, maybe in absentia. Professor Nathan Subramaniam, Director of Institute of Public Enterprise. Distinguished, uh, distinguished speakers especially Dr. Sanjay Kumar Sivastav, uh, Professor Michael N. Demers, Dr. Karen Sudmir, Mr. G Gary, uh, Loy Rigo, and Dr. Asatos Mohanty, the president of SEED, and of course, uh, the host, Dr. Anupama Dobe, guests, participants, viewers, it is indeed a privilege on my part to be a part of this international webinar on a very, very important topic and the theme relating to disaster risk reduction, resilience and sustainability. The topic holds immense, immense importance, not for any individual, located to any specific reason, but it is important for everyone across the globe. One gets uh, horrified to recount the sufferings of millions towards the end of the 20th century in Odisha, more spe specifically, the 1999 super cyclone that left over 10,000 people dead, several wounded, crops and livestock completely wiped off, road and communication infrastructure washed away, a disaster that is going to be remembered in the history. The lessons that is learned from this disaster, however, led the provincial government, the government of Odisha, to take several measures on disaster risk reduction, resilience and sustainability. By virtue of this, the government could effectively face the five subsequent natural calamities, namely the uh, cyclone, uh, Filin, that was in 2013, Hudud 2014, uh, Titli 2018, Fani 2019, Amfan 2020, and uh, very, very recently, the yes in 2021 with the least damage caused to the life of and property. This was possible because Urisa took a conscious decision and built upon its capacity, particularly at the community level. 
it has successfully started community level warning built multi purpose cycle cell, uh, cyclone shelters under the national cyclone risk mitigation project and built an early warning dissemination system with last mile connectivity the capacity to deal with natural disasters has increased tremendously at the community level in august 2020 the two coastal villages in odisha namely venkat raipur in ganjam district that is southern part of the state and nuliyasai in jagatsampur district which on the recognition of being tsunami ready from the unesco intergovernmental oceanographic commission making india the first country in the indian ocean region to establish such high levels of disaster preparedness at the community level community based disaster preparedness is the key to effective disaster management and certainly there is no disagreement to this and most part of the talk by the distinguished distinguished speakers also was uh, focused on community participation in more than one occasions therefore odisha has uh, received accolades from none other than even the united nations for its ability to handle natural calamities so effectively and so efficiently as well whereas the odisha model has become a benchmark we cannot afford to develop complacency rather we need to continue our efforts for zero casualty and quick restoration of normalcy and economic activities keeping this objective in mind we this odisha state open university are trying to conduct workshops and training on disaster management disaster preparedness and management including resilience and sustainability in our efforts to take the mission forward even to take it to the grassroots level that we are launching programs on disaster management even for the school kids of 12 years and above for their awareness and preparedness to face the challenges of disaster it is a great experience listening to the authority in the particular subject and uh, amrishio that this learning as somewhere also professor nathan mentioned that uh, we are not so technically sound with regard to disaster management but from the users and the uh, and and and, uh, uh, and uh, appreciating the ramification of the uh, disaster management for that i mean the disaster for that purpose that we really place ourselves to carry this mission forward to have partnership with uh, uh, national and uh, uh, international agencies and bodies uh, to propagate uh, the mission and uh, see that the sufferings of the people really calm down and becomes zero and uh, thank you very much uh, i must uh, also uh, put on record my sincere appreciation to dr uh, asutosh mahante who actually was the link between associate getting this university associated with this particular web, international webinar and for the information of uh, all the listeners and the viewers uh, that uh, uh, we i must uh, also mention that uh, the odisha state open university has already launched uh, uh, diploma in disaster management as well as certificate course in relief center and rehabilitation management and we and and and, and that too with the support of the national disaster management authority so uh, and, and the government of odisha also is trying uh, and uh, is uh, very proactive with regard to management of disaster so we are certainly there and we will be always there uh, to take the mission forward thank you very much thank you so much sir for sharing your knowledge and thank you very much for reducing my work because you have very elaborately uh, extended our sincere gratitude to all the invited speakers and also mention the points raised by them thank you so much sir not a single event can be performed without cooperation of each member of the team 
Each member of the team, their efforts are marvelous and embarked a new dimension in the field of disaster management risk reduction and resilience in form of this webinar, which we conducted today. On behalf of the organizing committee, I extend my sincere gratitude to all the invited speakers who gave their valuable time and nourished our mind with many innovative ideas, which took shape because of their experience of many years. I acknowledge each speaker on an individual basis, all the eminent guests and our participants for joining us in the event today. We sincerely extend our heartfelt gratitude to all the collaborators for the support and motivation extended. And as we all mentioned it, that specifically we want to extend our sincere gratitude to Professor Ashutosh Mohanty because he was the link who actually initiated this idea and implemented and today this webinar has concluded a remarkable, memorable and knowledgeable event in the respective domain with many innovative ideas to nourish our mind. This may be the end of today's session but undoubtedly this is a new beginning. We hope this collaboration will continue in future too to deliver and contribute more in the area of disaster management. So I thank you once again, all of you, for your participation in form of our invited speakers, in form of uh, the collaborators, in form of the participant, in form of our guest, and for giving your valuable time as well as your ideas. At the end, I will say that we will uh, share the feedback form. We will mail it to all of you. And we will also see the attendance on the basis of this. We will dispatch the uh, certificate uh, online. So over to you, Professor Mohanty. Thank you. <clears throat> With these concluding remarks, it's very, uh, very productive, uh, you know, con uh, this webinar. And I am very much thankful to Arkasar because of him I managed to this program very successfully and he giving some kind of thought ideas how to bring the people. So uh, finally I thanks and I see like so many opportunity will be come in the future. So we will collaborate, we will organize several activities further. So in this uh, note I, I thank to all and I thank all the participants, I thank thanks all the resource person of this event and uh, thank you very much. With this, we conclude this event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Namaskar, sir. Goodbye.